Greetings and salutations, today we will be covering the sensational story of the Halls Mills murder case. The Halls Mills murder case stands as an enigmatic testament to the depths of human intrigue and the haunting shadows of unresolved violence. The tale unfurls in Summerest, New Jersey in the tumultuous year of 1922 entwined within the threads of forbidden love, clandestine affairs, and a grisly demise. Edward Wheeler Hall, a prominent Episcopal priest, and Eleanor Mills, a cherished member of his choir, found themselves entangled in a scandalous liaison that would ultimately seal their fates. September 14th bore witness to their tragic end. Both became victims of an inexplicable yet brutal murder that would go on to grip the nation in its chilling embrace. Yet the web of suspicion did not end with their demise. Accusations would swirl implicating Hall's own wife and her brothers in a sinister plot. However, despite the weight of accusations, they would be acquitted in the 1926 trial, leaving the case shrouded in an unsettling air of uncertainty and doubt. Elnor Reinhard Mills was an enigmatic figure in life and a tragic one in death. She stood as the wife of James Mills and one of the unfortunate souls claimed in this heinous act of violence. Francis Noel Stevens Hall would be left as a widow marked by the tragic loss of Edward Wheeler Hall and embroiled as a defendant in the macabre 1926 murder trial. She had become a central figure in this mystery, a member of a grim host accused of a murder most foul. Adding a cryptic layer to the crime scene, there was a calling card found belonging to Reverend Edward Wheeler Hall, which was only discovered in the aftermath of the Hall Mills murder. This pivotal clue would cast the specter of unanswered questions for years to come, leaving the nation grappling with the aftermath of this perplexing tragedy. This case would garner unexpected media attention, painting a sprawling canvas of sensationalism that would rival even the infamous Lindbergh kidnapping of the 1930s. Within this tangled web of love, betrayal, and unrelenting suspicion lies a saga that echoes through the corridors of time, beckoning the relentless pursuit of truth and resolution. A saga etched indelibly in the history of unsolved mysteries. In the relentless pursuit of truth, the investigation into the Hall Mills murders revealed a chilling tableau of despair and brutality etched into the tranquil fields of Summerest County, New Jersey, with a precision that seemed to defy comprehension. September 16, 1922, witnessed the grim discovery of the lifeless bodies of Eleanor Mills and Edward Hall, poised in a grotesque harmony within the confines of a destitute field near a local farm. Their fate was sealed by the cold, unfeeling barrel of a 32 caliber firearm. They were a man shot in the head once and a woman brutalized thrice. The details of this morbid scene paint a picture of unfathomable horror. The man bore the mark of a single entry wound over his right ear and an exit wound clearly etched in the back of his neck. His visage veiled by a hat and eerily his calling card adorning the earth at his very feet lay as a cold testament to his demise. The woman, Elnor Reinhard Mills, suffered a more ghastly fate, even though it appeared she had been shot in a triad of locations. Her life snuffed out in a heart-wrenching flurry of violence. Her throat, cruelly severed, bore witness to the intrusion of nature's scavengers, the presence of maggots indicating the grim passage of time since their untimely demise. Their bodies were meticulously placed side by side bearing a haunting symbolism, feet directed towards the solitary crabapple tree in the field, a grotesque centerpiece which lay amidst this deadly tableau. There were torn remnants of love letters, shreds of intimacy marred by this brutal finale. Yet as investigators sought to unearth the truth, the dark tendrils of confusion gripped this case. A jurisdictional triangle born of the crime's proximity to the borders of Somerset and Middlesex counties clouded the initial response. Amidst this chaos, curiosity seekers descended upon the grim scene, trampling evidence and pilfering souvenirs, all the while callously passing around 
Reverend Hall's calling card, leaving the integrity of the scene and physical evidence in tatters. It would be noticed that Eleanor Mills bore the attire of the living, a blue dress with crimson polka dots, black silk stockings, and weathered brown shoes. Her blue velvet hat lay abandoned nearby, her brown silk scarf wrapped around her lifeless throat. A testament to the brutality of her demise in particular. Bruises and a cut lay upon her lip, and a hauntingly positioned hand marked her final moments of agony. Edward Wheeler Hall, the New Brunswick Episcopal priest, was forever silenced by the hands of brutality as well. But what had slain him was veiled from all those who had come to see the bodies, due to it being veiled beneath his hat which concealed the cruel fate bestowed upon him. A single firearm wound and a story untold, his spectacles perched upon his face, a tiny bruise upon his ear, and abrasions upon his fingers. Along with an inexplicable wound, his golden timepiece had also gone missing, while the coins nestled in his pocket were left untouched. This grim tapestry of violence could potentially have been left incomplete due to this horrid discovery being trounced upon by thrill seekers and due to the victims being desecrated by both human intrusion and nature's decay. In this convoluted tapestry of the Halls Mill case, the intricate lives of the victims offer glimpses into human connections that were not meant to be. Elnor Reinhardt, forever enshrined in history of tragedy, shared a life with James E. Mills. Their humble abode was nestled in 49 Carmen Street, New Brunswick, New Jersey, and stood as a testament to their domesticity. James dutifully served as acting sexton at St. John's Episcopal Church and shouldered the responsibility of a full-time janitorial role at Lord Sterling Elementary School. Both husband and wife stood as pillars of the community. Their union bore witness to the lives of two cherished offspring, Charlotte E. Mills, who passed in 1952, and Daniel Mills, who was alive until 1992. Their formidable bonds seemed like they would transcend the mortal boundaries as they found their eternal resting place at Van Lewis Cemetery, New Brunswick. Edward Wheeler Hall, on the other hand, was a charismatic figure entwined in this tragic narrative due to threads woven alongside his role with Francis Noel Stevens. Their union was sanctified on July 20th, 1911, marked by the beginning of a journey that would culminate in tragedy. Raised in the heart of Brooklyn, New York, Edward pursued theological studies in the bustling streets of Manhattan, shaping his destiny. His sojourn led him from the bustling cityscape to the serene embrace of Basking Ridge, New Jersey before finding his ecclesiastical calling at St. John's Evangelist Episcopal Church. Fate cruelly intervened. His final resting place was a poignant echo to his life, which lies in the Greenwood Cemetery in the heart of Brooklyn. In the shadowed aftermath of the Halls Mills murders, the investigation cast a sprawling net over a select few individuals ensnaring the suspects within its intricate web of suspicion and intrigue. Amongst those implicated in this macabre tale were Frances Noel Stevens, the wife of Edward Wheeler Hall, alongside her two brothers, Henry Hegwell Stevens and William Willie Carpenter Stevens. The haunting presence of a cousin was also noted in the likes of Henry de la Beauvier Carpenter, which further muddled the waters of this twisted saga. The initial inquiry was spearheaded by John E. Sticker in 1922 and yielded no indictments, leaving the grim specter of an unsolved mystery hanging heavy over the case. However, the persistent ripples of speculation nurtured by whispers within the columns of the New York Daily Mirror, fueled by revelations linked to an individual associated with Miss Hall's household staff, incited a resurgence in interest in this case. Governor A. Harry Moore, stirred by the specter of lingering doubt issued an order for a renewed investigation and subsequent trial in 1926. Within this legal whirlwind, Henry Carpenter orchestrated a successful bid for a separate trial, diverging from the fate shared by the three others accused. However, the tides of justice did not wash over him 
as fate dictated that he would never face the scales of justice in the court of law. The dazzling dance between suspects, speculation, and the elusive grasp of justice painted a picture of uncertainty that lingered ominously over the Hall Mills case. As the echoes of the past and the propensity for tainted evidence due to the Luxiers left an indelible mark creating a nearly impossible to solve puzzle whose difficulties were amplified due to the sprawling courtroom drama that unfolded in Summerrest County as the Hall Mills trials stands as a haunting testament to the fragility of justice and the intricate dance of legal theatrics. November 3rd, 1926 marked the commencement for a riveting legal spectacle with Charles W. Parker and Frank Cleary presiding as judges over this sensational trial that captivated the nation for nearly 30 days. The prestigious backdrop of the wealthy Stevens Carpenter families cast a colossal shadow over the proceedings, ensuring the gaze of a mesmerized nation lingering upon the trial. Alexander Simpson, the prosecuting attorney, wielded the hammer of justice against the defense, led by the formidable legal minds of Robert H. MacArthur, a former New Jersey Attorney General, Joseph A. Fort, the fingerprint expert, along with Raymond C. Skyker, who would stand at the helm of the jury and witness this legal saga. Delving deeper into the suspects, we are presented with Henry de la Riviere Carpenter, born on May 15, 1882, to John Nielsen Carpenter and Anna Nielsen Kemp, held his residence at the crossroads of Sidham Street and Nickel Avenue in New Brunswick, where he lived alongside his wife Mary Nelson, kin to Francis Stevens Hall and her brothers through the shared Carpenter lineage. Henry carved a path as a Wall Street stockbroker positioned tantalizingly close to the heart of the financial market. Though initially under the shadow of suspicion, he would evade the courtroom's justice by carrying his secrets to the grave due to his passing on May 26, 1934 where he would find his final repose in Elmwood Cemetery, North Brunswick. Then there is Francis Noel Stevens, who came into the world on January 13, 1874, to the esteemed Francis Kirby Stevens and Mary Nicole Carpenter. She wove her life intrinsically alongside Edward Hall. Their matrimonial bond seemingly sanctified on July 20th, 1911, which would later become the beginning of a macabre entry in the prosecution's narrative, a narrative painting her as the instigator in the murder of her unfaithful husband, and her earthly journey would conclude on December 21st, 1942, when she found her eternal rest beside her husband, regardless of his loyalty, in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. Her former abode was steeped in history and infamy and would later be absorbed into the realm of academia as the residence of the Dean of Douglas Residential College. The third suspect in this case was Henry Higwall Stevens, born on November 10th, 1869. He had seemingly charted a life past the bounds of suspicion. His marriage to Ethel Griffin on July 27th, 1901 painted a picture of domesticity far from the whirlwind of murder. He was a retired exhibition marksman residing in Lyottville, New Jersey. Henry's alibi would be further strengthened by his fishing escapades being noted as occurring miles away from the scene of the crime said day, where in no way would his marksman skills be able to pull off such a shot. He would succumb to a heart attack in Lyottville on December 3, 1939. The final suspect in this case was William Willie Carpenter Stevens, a colorful enigma in the realm of these suspects, and he emerged with peculiar traits and curious circumstances. He was born on March 13, 1872, and Willie's ownership of a particular firearm, one whose 32 caliber matched that of the murder weapon whose barrel was purportedly filed down for his safety, drew sharp scrutiny from both the prosecution and the public. In the prosecution's portrait, he was painted as the implicit provider of the weapon. His fingerprints were also noted to have left a mark 
on the calling card at the scene of the crime. However, due to having known the victim, the possibility that he had at some prior point touched said calling card is a likely one. However, his flamboyant figure on the witness stand and his life entangled with the fabric of local firehouse gatherings left him incapable of a steady employment. Willie's enigmatic demeanor seemed to resonate with those associated with high functioning autism, a condition which at the time had yet to find a clinical description he too would later pass on December 30th, 1942, leaving this case cloaked in a shroud of intrigue and a puzzling legacy left unsolved. In the labyrinth of mystery and suspicion that is the enticing Paul Mills murder case, one name stood out as a figure cloaked in peculiarity and surreal narrative. This was Jane Gibson, who would be unceremoniously dubbed the Pig Woman by the press. Jane Gibson residing with her son William in a repurposed barn off D. Rusey Lane earned her moniker from tending to the hogs on her property. Her account of the night of the murder bordered on the unbelievable, a tale interwoven with shadows, gunshots, and chilling screams which pierced through the night. She claimed she ventured out in the pursuit of a supposed corn thief astride her mule. Gibson then would stumble upon an unexpected scene. Four individuals locked in a heated dispute near the crabapple tree. Gunfire would seemingly shatter through the night's calm as two figures collapsed, their fates sealed in the darkness. An echo of don't thrice resounded through the air, etching a haunting echo in Gibson's memory. Adding to this surreal tapestry is how Gibson described a particular journey, a return to the crime scene under the glow of the well-lit night. In her testimony, she would recount a macabre scene witnessing Frances Stevens Hall sobbing over her husband's lifeless form, a narrative which, due to given prior evidence, seemed far too fantastical to believe. Yet the lunar phases lent credence to the fluctuations between the dark and shadowed night she had mentioned prior to this and the well-lit night upon which she stumbled upon the bodies as being the same night. In essence, her testimony somehow maintained that at the beginning of the night, it was a complete darkness that hid her from the assailants who committed the crime and who hid them from her. However, later in that same night, it was well lit enough for her to be able to clearly see one of the defendants crying over the body, yet she was not sighted. Despite the incredulity surrounding her testimony, the prosecution was seen as grasping at straws. In their quest for evidence, they would later escort Gibson to the New Brunswick train station in a desperate bid to validate her claim of spotting a potential suspect. Astonishingly, she identified a man, a cousin of Francis Stephen Hall, who himself was embroiled in the shadows of suspicion, but not to the same extent as the others. And from here, the press would believe that her tale held a kernel of truth, despite how strange it appeared. The impending trial hung almost solely on Gibson's anticipated testimony, but fate intervened cruelly. Days before her scheduled appearance, she fell gravely ill and was confined to a hospital bed. The pivotal witness would then remain teetering on the precipice of life and death. Yet the courtroom, witness to unprecedented scenes, would see her testimony delivered from her infirmary, monitored by medical staff, creating a surreal tableau which would forever be etched in judicial history. Despite her compelling narrative, the jury would remain skeptical, her story failing to sway the verdict. The defense meticulously dismantled the fingerprint evidence, and the trial's culmination would be delivered with a swift not guilty verdict. Frances Stephen Hall and her brothers emerged from this legal crucible unscathed due to there being reasonable doubt, leaving but chilling whispers of the murder of Reverend Hall and Eleanor Mills to persist through time, their story adorning the courthouse, lingering reminders of a chilling crime that still echoes through the annals of the unsolved. The trial which unfolded amidst a whirlwind of testimony, intrigue, and legal skirmishes. Unfortunately, what little evidence existed aside from Jane Gibson and her pivotal role as a witness, while taking center stage, did not bear fruit. Her testimony 
being seen as a shifting narrative and the varying shades of competency in securing the location and evidence left police, newspapers, and those within the very court's halls itself, painting a canvas of uncertainty and casting shadows of question upon the truth. Despite the incessant efforts of the prosecution and their tantalizing dance around legal maneuvers, the trio of defenders, Miss Hall and her brothers, would emerge from the courtroom unscathed, leaving naught but an echo that would trigger lawsuits upon lawsuits. Yet in the haunting echoes of the Hall's Mill's tale, the tantalizing tendrils of treachery and twisted tales threaded their way through the labyrinth of curiosity and enigma, from a sordid symphony of a salacious coupling to the bizarre and bewildering testimony of a witness whose very night shifted from darkness to light, which left a trail of unanswered questions. Yet despite the quagmire of questions and the cacophony of clues, the whispers of Reverend Hall and Eleanor Mill still lingered, their fates entwined in this unsolved enigma, a cryptic codex bound by the elusive truth seemingly never to be solved. If you remained with me until the end, I thank you, and I do hope you stay tuned and subscribe for more content.